Wonderful. Well, welcome, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for the second and final of our online webinar series um, for, for ME CFS Advocacy Week 2019. Welcome to DC, hashtag Congress Fight for ME. Uh, my name is Emily Taylor. I'm the Director of Advocacy and Community Relations here at the Solve ME CFS Initiative, and I'm joined here by my uh, friend and colleague, uh, Aaron Rodriger. Hi everyone, I'm so glad to speak with you today. We're so excited, um, crazy to think that in a week we will be in DC and uh, storming the hills of Congress. Truly, so um, we're very excited to get started. Um, and so we'll just dive right in. It's a little slide with some information about us. Um, Aaron and I are uh, the key organizers for this joint partnership for ME Advocacy Week. Um, and we're just going to start, oh, sorry, my apologies. Um, this is actually uh, oh, going to be an audience poll, so I'm going to manage the poll. Erin, if you want to take it away. Yeah, so um, hopefully I think on the um, right-hand side of the screen, you should be able to take a poll. And we want to know, from uh, those of you on the call, how will you be joining us um, during Advocacy Week? Um, will you be coming with us to D.C.? Um, will you be taking local action um, and are you just joining us to learn a little bit more about advocacy and some training information? So at this time, um, please select which option you'll be joining with us and um, we will hear from you guys soon. All right. Oh, uh, the votes are getting tallied. We have 84% yeah. of folks who have voted. I'm going to close the poll in just a couple seconds if anybody else wants to weigh in. All right. I'm going to close the poll now. Wonderful. Well, it looks like a good chunk of you on this call are coming with us to DC. So wonderful. You'll get to see Emily and I in person and we look forward to seeing with, with you all. And um, for those of you who are coming here to learn more about advocacy and training, this would be a really great way as we will um, discuss a lot of important um, asks for, for today and what we're focusing on um, congressionally for, for advocacy week and um, moving forward. Uh, here is an agenda of what today is including. So um, we're going to go over the big picture. Um, so the strategic purpose of um, MECFS Advocacy Week. We're going to go over the game plan, what our, and we have a, our, what our asks are for this year, which I know a lot of people have been wanting to know. Um, the third thing we're going to discuss is getting prepared. So we're going to go through a detailed walkthrough of April 2nd events in Bethesda, um, and then we're going to go on to what Wednesday, April 3rd will look like on the Hill. So we'll do a detailed walkthrough of what those events on Capitol Hill look like. And then, of course, as Emily mentioned, we'll leave um, time for questions. So if anyone has questions about what the week includes and entails, we'll have some time at the end to kind of dive into those. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, so I'm going to touch a little bit on the big picture, what the strategic purpose of MECFS Advocacy Week is. And since over 95% of you um, who are on this webinar are actually joining us in Washington, D.C., I'm going to focus a bit more on that so, um, so we can kind of get a sense of what we're doing together. So um, why does MECFS Advocacy Week matter? Um, you see a lot of organizations do events like this. So it's not just we're following the crowd, but there is a very specific and important reason why mobilizing advocacy in one place really makes a difference. Um, so to give you a sense of what we're trying to accomplish here, it is a nationwide effort in the United States, and we are specifically targeting Congress, which means the U.S. Senate and the House of Representatives. Um, the, the goals of MECFS Advocacy Week are really, it's in, in many ways, it's a show of force, um, but it's also an important opportunity to educate legislators and staff on MECFS. And we've seen this become um, really effective. This is actually our third MECFS Advocacy Week. Um, SMCI has led this action in, in for, for the, since 2017. And every year we see tangible uh, results. We see um, a, a bigger response from Congress. We see name recognition um, a, a, a for the disease. Um, legislators and staff are now using the term MECFS um, instead of chronic fatigue syndrome or what are you talking about? Um, so we're seeing that it's it, it, that our, our effects are building on top of each other and it really is um, starting to see its shape uh, policy in the federal government. 
Uh, so the other idea behind a mass mobilization in a very short time period is creating a momentum and buzz for MECFS on Capitol Hill. We want people to be talking about us. We want people to recognize us. We want people to ask questions. Um, and that's not going to happen unless it's kind of a visible, uh, tangible um, event that people are, are interacting with. And of course, uh, building relationships for future actions. These, um, I often use the analogy about first advocacy meetings, that it's a little bit like a first date. Um, you, you don't immediately jump in the bed with somebody after the first date. You're kind of feeling each other out. Well, you know, what sort of music do you like? What movies are you into? And that's a little bit like some of these very first touch points from an advocacy day action when you're meeting with your office. You know, what is your issue? What areas of policy do you touch upon? Um, what type of funding issues matter to you? So it's kind of feeling each other out to see if this is a good partnership for the long term. And we have seen and we have cultivated amazing champions as a result of previous ME advocacy weeks. And so these first touch points are really important to start building long term relationships as we start looking for champions in Capitol Hill that are in, in particular key committees or areas as we try to move policy forward. And then, of course, there's always the question, why do we target Congress? Um, well, Congress controls the, the purse strings, as um, you, you may remember from civics. Um, Congress can put pressure on other agencies through oversight, which um, things like appropriations committee report language is a mechanism through which Congress provides guidance to agencies and how they operate. Um, so if we're saying things like, for example, at the CDC, we're not happy with your website content and we encourage you to change that. We actually didn't put that two years ago in committee report language and it sort of uh, indicates the, um, the uh, goals of Congress for agency behavior. And of course, Congress creates accountability. Congress is the, uh, the purse strings, as I said, and so they can control the money that goes to programs depending on outcomes. So accountability um, is the hearing process which Congress holds to investigate where money potentially went awry or are programs accomplishing the outcomes they want to see. And, um, and members of Congress are the spearheads that create that governmental accountability. And of course, ultimately, point number four, Congress works for us. These folks, you, you hired them by, with your vote. Um, they're working on your dime. They're controlling your taxpayer dollars, and so they are, by their job definition, need, needing to respond to the issues brought up by their constituents, which are you. Um, so this is really just a mechanism to, com to, to amplify your voices and your stories to your members of Congress. Um, so just really quickly touching on the scope of MECFS Advocacy Week this year, um, this is the largest action we've ever done. Um, we have uh, over 220 advocates from across the country have registered to participate. We are currently targeting um, or requesting 218 meetings have been requested uh, on your behalf. We already have secured 10 member level meetings, which is uh, fantastic. That's meetings that are with the member of Congress themselves and not their staff. Um, again, it creates a very tangible presence on Capitol Hill. This year we'll be wearing blue. So everywhere you see the, the blue t-shirts, you'll know that those are our folks. Um, and we're and as I said before, we're genuinely seeing a response from Congress. We're seeing uh, touch points from members who had previously been completely unclued on this issue. We're starting to cultivate really strong champions and coalitions in the on the Hill. And all of it really comes out of these, these uh, mobilized efforts. And we are very sensitive and understand that unlike many other communities, the MECFS community has this extra challenge of our energy and capacity. It makes advocacy on a large scale very difficult because at any given time, you know, between 25 to 75 percent of our advocates are just not up to doing advocacy that day because that's the nature of this terrible disease. So that's why we make our efforts so concentrated that we can do more with the limited energy capacity that everyone has. And so we're kind of maximizing um, your voice in the best way that we can. And that's kind of that's what we're accomplishing or we're hoping to accomplish with ME Advocacy Week this year. Oh, and I'll pass it over to Erin to touch upon um, our, our work this, for the asks. Yes, thanks so much, Emily. Um, so this, now we're gonna get into the game plan. Um, we're gonna talk about what our asks are for this year. Um, and these are the kind of, as you go through your meeting on the Hill, you're going to, you know, 
ask what they know about ME and CFS, you're going to share your story, and then you're going to get to kind of the, the heart of it, the meat, is the ask that we want them to take action for um, to make sure that we are represented and, and heard within Congress. Um, so when you have your meetings, you are going to be giving a, been given a packet. Um, um, so when you come on Tuesday, we'll have those packets available for you. So if you get it stuck at any time and don't know all of the answers, that is perfectly fine. Um, you can always refer to your packet um, that you'll have, and that will have, you know, one sheets or information that you can hand out. Or again, you know, as we mentioned in our last call, um, if you always, if you get questions, you can take um, notes about those questions and then let us know as staff and we'll follow up. But um, our three main asks this year is one, co-sponsoring our resolution for MECFS awareness. Um, so we're gonna ask them to review the draft resolution, resolution language um, in the packet and become a co-sponsor before May 6th. Um, support both of our appropriation requests. Um, we currently have two appropriation request letters going on, um, one for defense and one for labor, HHS. Um, so ask them to review them and sign on if they haven't. And then the third one is going to be a social media. We really want to help raise awareness on social media. So when you're at your office, we're going to ask that you um, schedule, um, have them take a photograph with you guys at the office, and then um, work with the office to schedule a social media post on International MECFS Awareness Day on May 12th. Um, and there will be a guide for that um, in the packet. So those are our three kind of main asks for um, Advocacy Week. So the first one um, is the co-signing of our MECFS resolution. Um, some of you might remember last year we were also working on our resolution, um, but this year we're really excited is that um, it's going to be bicameral. So it's going to be both in the House and in the Senate. Um, and so we're wanting uh, this resolution is honoring International Awareness MECFS uh, day and the language so far has been reviewed by both Republican and Democratic offices and the Senate Health Committee and then in May it we planned it to be introduced through a hotline process the second week of May um, and so our goal is you know if they could co-sign that is wonderful if not we just really ask for them to not oppose or abstain when the vote comes to the floor so that is what our the resolution uh, ask looks like Fantastic. And um, I'll just, just before we move on, I just want to add in that for those of you who didn't join us for our last training, um, which was how to conduct your meeting, um, we go into a sample meeting um, and where these asks come up in your meeting um, flow. So um, if you're kind of feeling a little lost or confused about where these fit in, please go back and watch the webinar we did um, a couple weeks ago. And then you'll see that with slots, these, these asks are that component of the meeting. Um, so they fit right in. Um, so then, uh, I'll, so thank you so much for that. Um, and then moving on, um, so we have two appropriations requests, um, both in the House and the Senate. Um, to, to back up a little bit, appropriations is um, the process through which the government forms our budget. Um, and it's a consensus-based process that comes initially from the executive branch from the administration who su submits a proposed budget to Congress, then both houses independently review the budget that is submitted and make adjustments and changes as they feel prioritization should be for money and, and resources. Then um, there's what's called a reconciliation process in which happens behind closed doors in which the House version of the new potential budget for the new year and the Senate version of the new potential budget for the new year G come together and they go line by line and decide which budget is um, is the the version they're going to use for that particular section. So one of the reasons it's so important that we have both an appropriations request in the House and an appropriations request in the Senate, and they are identical. The two requests are identical, which means that we are in both versions of the budget. So when the reconciliation process happens and the House folks and the Senate folks close the doors and go behind and, and work out which version of the budget they are going to use, we're in both versions, which sort of ensures that our issues are most likely to get funded. So our two appropriations requests this year um, are, uh, are again, identical in both the House and the Senate. And one is what we're calling the defense appropriations request. And this is the, the appropriations request that is being submitted to the defense subcommittee. 
and this is the simpler of our two requests. It is simply a request that MECFS is included in an existing peer-reviewed medical research program, which is sort of like an advanced version of the NIH, but not the NIH, and it's hosted at the, at the DOD, the Department of Defense. This program is about $350 million a year, and it funds high-risk, high-reward grants um, in a very specific areas of research that are specified by Congress. So what we're asking for is that Congress specify MECFS as one of these, quote, eligible disease topics for this program so that our researchers can submit grants and compete for funding in this, in this area. And traditionally, we haven't been in this program. We, um, so our talking points when we speak to members about this request is talking point one, this is a request for committee report language, and it's in the defense appropriations bill. Committee report language is what I mentioned earlier. It's that way that Congress specifies to agencies what they would like to have happen. So that's the kind of request we're making. Number two, this is making MECFS an eligible disease topic for the peer-reviewed medical research program. That's the name of the program. And I know everything in, in, uh, in Capitol Hill has many acronyms. So the acronym for this program is PRMRP. And we're asking that MECFS be made a part of that program. MECFS was actually already in this program back in uh, 2011, but it was removed in 2012. And um, we'd like it to get put back in. Um, one of the uh, pushback that you'll often get from offices is they don't like making carve outs for dollars for, for other folks. So, um, so that's one of the cases that is very strong in favor of this. This is not a carve out. This simply allows MECFS grants to be competitive with other grants in this program, and it's based on scientific merit. So we're not asking for special treatment. We're not asking for special dollars. We're asking for the ability to compete for our science to speak for itself. And of course, this is the really important point, number five, and this is something that is um, why this is such an interesting uh, tactic for our, uh, our efforts and research funding to use is that um, according to Dr. Nancy Klimas, who, as many of you know, is an uh, m amazing MECFS clinical care research expert out of Florida, she also specializes in Gulf War illness. And she says that clinically, MECFS and Gulf War illness symptoms are nearly identical. So that's why this is so important to the Department of Defense, and that's why we are a natural fit for this particular program, and that we do have so much overlap with Gulf War illness and that we need to investigate why this is affecting our soldiers and how we can make them better. So um, that's sort of a, a wrap up of our specific request regarding um, the defense program. Um, moving on to the second appropriations requests. Erin, if you wanna take, take that one. Yeah. So our second request is um, what we were calling our working with the labor HSS um, subcommittee. Um, and so the request is to sustain um, increase for funding for the CDC programs. Um, currently, it's at 5.4 million. Um, and so we're asking to increase for up to 9.9 .9 million. So that is a $4.5 million increase. Um, so this is really an exciting opportunity, um, you know, um, to our champions on the Hill are really um, been fighting for us to have an increase in funding. And so um, we're really excited that they're that they are supporting this increase in funding for us. Um, where this funding is being directed is at first a national um, epidemiological study. Um, and this is a three to four year project. Um, and so um, this will take, and this is why this sustained funding increases that um, will help make sure this project is, is taken over those three to four years and is done correctly. Um, the other thing is the um, medical education, making sure that the um, uh, CDC continues its medical education um, and working with um, our medical experts, um, disease experts, to make sure that the you know public is better educated and our doctors and uh, medical institutions are better educated. Also working to expand the ECHO project, was a, which is a tele-mentoring program for people. So depending on where they're at, uh, if they're in rural areas of the country, that they can access this 
opportunity to learn more about MECFS. Um, and then also the last part of it is to accelerate the results of um, MCAM. Um, what is really wonderful about this increase, and especially about the EPI study, is that there's never been this type of study before um, on MECFS. And so this data will greatly improve the government response. And so we're really um, excited about having this opportunity for this increase. Um, we know that um, with regards to getting some of these things done through a governmental um, agency, it provides a lot of um, strength um, to the reports. And so having these reports then help us move forward with asking for more funding and more research. So um, we're really hopeful this um, this part of the appropriations request will be will be approved and submitted um, to the budget. All righty. Okay. So the next one, I think I talked a little bit about it on um, when we we're going over the all three asks. Well, the next one is the raising awareness on social media. Um, so as probably majority of you all know, uh, International ME CFS Awareness Day falls on May 12th. And so the goal of this um, ask is to kind of to ask your member to take a social media action for us. So either um, post a picture of, we're asking them to post a picture of the meeting, you know, so when you get after your meeting, um, you know, you'll see, you've probably seen people taking photographs in the hallway in front of the, uh, uh, the nameplate on the wall of the member's name and state and the flags. Um, and so sometimes there's pictures in the offices. So if you're taking a picture with the member, um, there's two things. Ask him to post that day, um, you know, in, uh, in support of ME um, Advocacy Week. Also, ask them to post that picture on May 12th. Um, and so, uh, you know, that is a great way. So if you as the you know the volunteer activist if you're taking the picture also make sure to save that photo and um send it to us um and we will then make sure that we'll remind the staff around me um to repost it on may 12th so you want to capture that picture and save that picture the other thing is to post your own picture um throughout the day um so multiple pictures at your multiple meetings as you're going out um hanging out around the hill to post pictures to tag and thank your members um you know social media accounts so get their hashtags and their you know their at addresses um and then you know if you tag them and then ask them to hopefully repost and or re retweet what you're posting out there um we will have a whole entire um kind of social media guide in your packet both for the congress member or um to to know what to do so they you can hand it to them and then also there will be a social media guide for you as the attendee um to to know what to do so um but we're really excited we just kind of want to fly social media both on advocacy day and then also come may 12th we want to have a great presence we want to see our members of congress um raising um, awareness and support for us on may 12th Wonderful. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, so those are the asks, <clears throat> excuse me, that we are um, asking as part of MECFS Advocacy Week this year. Um, and so we're going to pause here for some questions because I knew there would be some uh, some interesting thoughts about why and how we're approaching Congress. And uh, you guys did not disappoint. Um, so I, I'm going to take the first question and then I'll pass it back over Aaron for, for the second one. So I'm going to, I'm going to take these first two questions are actually similar. So I'm going to combine them into one question. Um, and the question is, uh, how do we know if our member has already supported the appropriations request? And that is a great question. So um, as I described uh, when I was talking about the appropriations process, we have both a house and the Senate letter. And because of the magic of the government shutdown earlier this year, the entire appropriations process has been a thrown a bit off kilter from the usual deadlines that we would expect to see in a typical appropriations year. So what ended up happening, um, and this was just out of our control um, because of the way the government was, was set up time-wise this year, the House appropriations deadlines, so the House request letter going to the U.S. House of Representatives um, was actually sent out last week, and today is the deadline for House sign-ons. So we will hear back from our congressional champions today, um, at the end of the day, how many and which representatives signed on to that request letter. 
And we will make sure to post that um, and have that information available. So, and we'll make sure to bring copies to DC. So for our house folks, that means that your representative in the US House of Representatives, you'll be able to see a list of who signed on. And if your member did sign on, you can thank them. And that's one of the best things you can do. I mean, positive feedback is even more effective than negative feedback. So when you call up your congressman and yell at them for doing a bad job, that maybe gets some level of reaction. But when you call them up and tell them they're doing a great job and they've secured your vote, that's even better. So if you're a member of Congress, uh, took action for our House appropriations requests. We'll know today and we'll have that list and you'll be able to tell them, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. We're so grateful for you supporting our effort. And if they didn't, when you meet with them um, next week, you'll say, hey, this is this action that happened. It pro you know, we really wish you would have signed on. Maybe you'll take a look at it and consider supporting it in the future or maybe next year. So it's a good talking point on that front. Now, flipping to the Senate side, the Senate had their deadlines pushed back even further than the House did. So this is one of the, the fortuitous circumstances of our timing. In addition to being at the height of cherry blossom season, we're also going to be at the height of the Senate appropriations deadlines, which are actually after we meet. So when you're meeting with your senators, not your representatives, but your senators, the letters are still going to be open for co-signers. So um, you can definitely, when, we, when you meet with your, your senators, say, please, please, please sign on to this letter. You have until the end of next week to do so. Please sign us. And we'll have all of those copies of those letters available in your packets. And so they'll be able to see the language and decide whether they want to co-sign. And that's going to be really powerful because you'll have a very specific, clear action with a very specific, clear deadline that they can take right then. Um, so I hope that was probably a very long answer to, to the question, but I hope that answers um, those two questions about whether or not your member has signed on to the appropriations request. Um, I'll pass it back to Aaron. Do you want to take uh, Janet's question? Yes, um, I, I think Janet asked a couple of them. Um, I will I will take a quick question about um, um, do we need to register as a lobbyist? Um, and I, no, um, we're coming as advocates um, and just really, you know, there to raise awareness and raise um, these asks to our members of Congress um, so that they can be, they know what the community and what their constituents want um, and, and change. So um, I think lobbyists is a little bit different. Um, um, they get paid money to do the work um, since you guys are volunteers then coming in as activists um, and you're not getting paid to do this um, and you don't need to register as, as a lobbyist. Um, so yeah, um, did you wanna take the peer reviewed about defense question? Absolutely. I'll, I'll, there's two questions that popped up about um, the appropriations defense uh, question. Um, so I'll just touch on that a, a briefly. Um, so here, let me put the slides back so we can look at it while we talk about it. There we go. Um, so the, uh, the peer reviewed uh, medical research program is not linked to DARPA. DARPA is a whole different program in a whole different department and, um, and, and looks at sort of a different high risk, high reward, but more directly related to active military combat. The peer reviewed medical research program is more linked, uh, I believe the exact language in the, um, the statute talks about the, the health and readiness of combat troops, veterans, and their families. So it's a broader mandate than DARPA, which is really zeroed in on kind of active combat methods. Um, so that's one of the big differences between those two programs. And while they both fund research using a grant competitive mechanism, the peer reviewed medical research program, again, is sort of a broader for the health and well-being, whereas DARPA is more like military combat, let's get some cool toys that blow people up. <laughs> um, so I, that, uh, that's kind of a big, uh, that's a, I mean, there's a lot of details that I'm glossing over, but that's kind of a big picture overview of the difference between the programs. The other thing that makes the defense peer-reviewed medical research program very unique is that it is directly controlled by Congress. Um, 
and uh, and I, I can go into all the positives and negatives about why this is really interesting and unique. But what what I think makes the program most special is that it's not carte blanche. We just look at the grants, decide which one we like best, and fund them. Um, it actually takes into account the impact the grants have on the wider field, which is something that's very special, especially when it comes to the needs of MECFS. So as we know, the MECFS research field has a lot of gaps in it that desperately need to be filled, and we're missing a lot of key pieces of information, things like the natural history of our disease, you know, different onsets, subtyping, I could go on and on. But what the peer-reviewed medical research program does is they have specialized review panels that look at the grants and they're generated based on the subject area of the grant. So a cancer panel looks at cancer and a blood disease panel looks at blood disease and they actually will assemble an MECFS panel to review MECFS. And one of the mechanisms they look at when they review the grant applications is of course the quality of the science, you know, the quality of the grant application, the feasibility, the budget, all of those things that we would expect them to look at, but they also look at, will this meet a need in the research space, in the field at large? And that's a piece that NIH does not look at. And that's one of the reasons why we feel that this program is a really good fit for MECFS. Um, so that was, again, a very long answer to a simple question, but I hope that answers your questions about why the defense program is unique and why we really feel it's a high priority to get into it. Erin, um, you wanted to, uh, I'm seeing a lot of questions that we're going to answer in the second part of the presentation about kind of logistics of the day when you're on Capitol Hill. But Erin, um, do you want to take uh, one of the other questions and then I'll bounce back on appropriations? Yes, that is perfectly fine. Um, I think one of the questions was, will these asks be detailed in our packets in DC? And yes, um, you will definitely get, um, again, on Tuesday, we'll go over a training of all of these again, and there'll be more time to kind of get into a discussion about what these are. And then in your packets, there will be a handout for each ask that goes into detail. Um, so you'll have it be able in front of you. Um, you'll also be able to pass it over to who you're meeting with in the meeting. Um, so you'll definitely have all of the information that you need on, on that information. Um, so yes. And then another question about posting the photos. And I do uh, apologize if I was a little um, over the place. So there's two, there's two kind of asks with regards to the social media asks. Um, the first one is, um, taking a photo with your member of Congress um, and asking them um, to post a picture either on that day um, on you know April 3rd and then asking them to post a picture again on May 12th um, and so we want to at least capture one photo um, and then either they can post it that day April 3rd um, you can then if you got them you know they're they're okay and they're yes to post on May 12th. Um, you as the advocate can then resend it to them or we as a staff at SMCI and ME Action will then also resend it to them saying, hey, we met with you, you know, about a month, a little bit over a month ago. Um, you said you would post this. Here's the picture we recommend and we'll provide verbiage for them to use. Um, so those are kind of the two photos. But throughout the day that you're in DC, um, continue to post pictures, continue to say, here we are, you know, we're, you know, I think we're hashtag Congress fight for ME, hash, you know, hashtag storming DC. Um, so those are all different things um, that you'll be doing throughout the day. So hopefully I, I answered the, the posting the pictures. So there's two things posted on the day, April 3rd, and then again, really asking them to have a big influence on May 12th on social media with posting another picture. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, so I'm going to take one more question when it comes to the asks, and I'm again going to combine two questions in one. So there were two questions that came out over the labor HHS question, and I'm going to try to answer these um, quickly, and then we'll move on because we're getting a lot of logistical questions about what's happening in DC, and I want to leave time for that. So um, really quickly, the Department of Labor HHS, or I should say the Appropriations Bill, which we abbreviate as Labor HHS, is actually Labor, Health and Human Services, Education, and Other Related Services. That's the whole name of the committee. So it's a big 
block of programs that end up sort of funneled together in one appropriations bill. So um, while it, the name of the committee includes things like the Department of Labor and other different entities, they're all just kind of cobbled together in one piece of legislation and then they're each subsectioned out so um, to their own funding uh, pieces. So, um, so the request that we're making while it's in the big piece of legislation known as Labor HHS, which includes Department of Education and Labor and all these other things, it's simply uh, a CDC related uh, request only. So that answers that question. And then folding in the second question, um, so uh, as, as some of you may know, when it comes to appropriations, the NIH generally has its own budget that's divided by institute and very few programs relative to the number of total NIH programs are actually called out specifically by Congress. And those are the exceptions rather than the rule. The general rule is that Congress does not tell the NIH what to do with their money, except as I mentioned, in very few exceptions, things like autism or Alzheimer's or certain types of cancers that have risen to the level where they've gotten their own standalone legislation. And that is a goal where we would someday like to see MECFS get, but we're not quite there yet. In the meantime, the only line item we have in the federal budget is the CDC chronic fatigue syndrome program. Um, and that is specifically what we're asking for in the labor HHS bill, because that is a line item in that bill under the uh, Center for Emerging and Zoonic Diseases. And we are one of two line items in that center. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons why we get targeted so frequently, because uh, we have our own line item and that makes us very easy to scratch. Um, so in that line item, that single line item, there are currently four programs being funded and one of them is the MCAM study. Um, and I realized we did not explain what that acronym meant, my apologies. MCAM stands for Multi-Clinical Site Assessment of MECFS. And this has been an ongoing program and the goal of this, this study has been to um, to identify a clinical uh, disease diagnosis or a, a, a specific, um, I'm forgetting the actual scientific technical term at the moment, my apologies, but a disease definition of MECFS and to, to study the different onsets and all these different pieces of the disease to kind of come up with a definitive, this is the disease spectrum. Um, and we expected publication results from the MCAM study two years ago. And the study is running woefully behind schedule. And that's one of the reasons why our specific request is asking for money to be directed to accelerate the results of NCAM. Um, and one of the reasons why the study is running so behind schedule is because we get zeroed out from the federal budget every year. And imagine trying to run a multi-year program when at the end of every year, you have to pretend like your program's getting canceled and shut down all of your operations. And then, of course, us, us as advocates come in and scream and yell and get the budget put back together. And so then, yay, we have funding. They ramp up again. They run for eight months. And then as the budget announces that the program's defunded, they have to zero out again. So it's almost like this program is being run with one hand behind its back because tied behind its back because every year as our funding gets eliminated in the federal budget, they have to respond to that and, and zero out the program and then ramp it back up again. So that's one of the real challenges and that's why this request is so targeted to sustained funding for this program. Um, we can't have a program that's only operating eight months out of the year and then constantly ramping up or ramping down. We want to have the program to have the confidence, the stability to run multi-year projects continually without having to this like start, stop, uh, stutter step method. And so that's one of the key asks and why sustained funding, and I have to emphasize that again, sustained funding for this program is a must if we're going to see results for these multi-year projects like we would like to see. Um, so that brings us at time. I'm sorry I went a little over. Um, we're going to get into the logistics of the day because we're getting some questions about what to expect the day of. And um, and then we will circle back. And of course, any other questions we don't get to, we'll definitely respond in Q&A afterwards. So um, from there, uh, we'll talk about getting prepared 
for the April 2nd events at the Marriott Bethesda um, in uh, the Marriott Ho Hotel in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, so I'll just dive right in. So um, the first day of our DC actions and ME CFS Advocacy Week is on Tuesday, April 2nd, where we're going to have training and networking events for the day, um, which we're hoping to utilize so folks can meet with their groups, uh, start planning together, and learn some of these tools and tricks to get the most out of their advocacy meetings. Um, so I got a couple of questions about folks about um, if you have to come to the events on Tuesday, you do not have to. We are live broadcasting them. So if you're just really having a bad day and you want to watch from bed, well, that's an option as well. But we do encourage people to come if you can so that you can meet your group and start planning. Um, you will receive your individualized schedule no later than Monday, April 1st. We're hoping to get them out earlier, but again, we are kind of subject to the whims of Congress when it comes to scheduling. So we'll try to lock them down as, as, as firm as we can. And you will get a 99% a, a, a firm schedule on Monday, April 1st. And so by the time Tuesday rolls around, you'll know who's in your group, you'll know which meetings you're having, so you can start to find those people at these events and start to chat with them. Um, the morning is going to kick off at 9 a.m. with breakfast for the uh, SMCI-sponsored Empower ME Roundtable. This will be live streamed as well and also in person. This is an event that has been like a personal dream of mine that I'm really excited to finally get off the ground. Um, I found as a caregiver when I went to doctor's appointments with my mom or disability hearings with my mom, I was always struggling to find my role as support, yet do I tell her story if she's having a bad day? How do we communicate? And these, these situations felt so uncomfortable, and I always wanted to take what I have learned through blood, sweat, and tears with my mother's experience and share it with others to hopefully make their journey in these situations easier. And that's exactly what we're doing with the Empower ME Roundtable. So we have two panels, one specifically in the doctor's office and one in, um, in advocacy situations of other kinds to sort of role play a bit what these situations are like and how to get through them in a more empowered way so that you don't feel so helpless because that's I know the feeling that I felt so often when I went through my mom with these experiences. Um, so so turning away from that, so after the Empower ME Roundtable um, from 9 to noon and breakfast will be provided, the ME CFS Advocacy Day check-in and registration will open. You can just come on by. We'll give your packets, your t-shirts, we'll check you in, we'll get you all set up. Um, and also during that time from 1 to 2.30, we'll have um, video folks set up so that if you feel like you want to record your story and share it as part of ME CFS Advocacy Day, you can do that. It's a good practice to get you in the mood for telling your story on Capitol Hill. At 3 o'clock, we'll begin the training, um, and the training will be divided into three parts um, with lots of ample breaks in between for folks to kind of rest and recuperate, and there will be snacks and refreshments. Um, so starting at 3 o'clock, we'll do general breast practices, which is going to cover a lot of what we talked about in the first webinar, but more honed into DC. Um, then at 4.15, we're going to talk about your prime advocacy mobile tool, which is a phone-based a mobile tool that you'll be able to use to access your meetings, record notes, get documents. It's a really cool thing. So we'll be training you on how to use your mobile tool. Um, then we'll have another break. And then the last part of the training, we'll talk about really in depth what we talked about here with the asks and what we're trying to accomplish in Congress this year. And then if you still have any energy left, um, you're welcome to hang out for our, uh, our networking reception where advocates can connect with one another and kind of talk about what they learned and apply that for strategy for their meetings the next day. There will be a cash bar because everyone's going to need wine and then also um, food and snacks for people to kind of get fueled up. And all of that is taking place at the Bethesda Hotel in Maryland. Um, we are working on getting discount parking. Um, we'll have a uh, little redemption validation tickets that you can use on, upon exiting. Parking at the hotel is $17 a day. Um, and I don't know how much the, the reduced parking vouchers will give you a discount for. We're, we're still getting those from the hotel, but I'll let you know as soon as we have them. Um, and also for folks who are joining us at the hotel, there, oops, I went ahead on the slide. For folks who are joining us at the hotel, um, we have an entire meeting wing of the hotel set aside just for us. It's called the Congressional Suites. 
Um, and there's a separate handicap specific entrance by the parking lot um, known as entrance E or the, the, um, the meeting entrance. Um, so for folks who maybe need a little extra time walking or you know, trying to reduce their steps, it, there's, a, there's a sign there that says parking entrance E and you wanna park closer to that one, it'll save you some walking to go around the main entrance. You can also get in from the main entrance, it's just closer to get into that side entrance. Um, also, we're gonna have a check-in table in the lobby of the hotel on Monday evening, April 1st, for those of you who are traveling in on Monday. So you can check in with us a little earlier if you'd like. And again, the hotel address there is 5151 Pooks Hill Road in Bethesda, Maryland. Um, I have been told that there is overnight street parking available um, around the hotel um, after 6 p.m. So for folks who are coming in maybe later in the evening, um, you can park there overnight after 6 p.m. Um, so that's kind of a breakdown of um, our training day on April 2nd. Yes, and then we head into Wednesday, April 3rd, which we have deemed is our day on the hill. Um, and so we're going to go through a walkthrough of what that day's timeline will look like for you. Um, all right, so um, we start kind of early in the morning um, if you want to. Um, the first bus will leave the hotel at 7.30 a.m. Um, and it will head to the Cannon Building. And we're going to be having a networking breakfast in the Cannon Building, and that will start around 8.30. Um, so if you would like to participate in that breakfast, you're not required to attend uh, breakfast. You can do breakfast on your own. You can get it at the hotel, however you want. Um, but our first bus will be leaving at 7.30 to get there for breakfast starting at 8.30. Um, we will then have a second bus leaving around 810, um, a third bus leaving around 910. Um, because we want to see everyone in blue and everyone together, we'll be doing an advocacy day team picture at 915. And then the final bus will be leaving um, the hotel at 940. Um, so that's the kind of early morning um, kind of layout the first bus and the third bus. So the 7.30 a.m. and the 9.10 a.m. bus will both be ADA accessible. Um, and so again, depending on your schedules, you can come whenever you want to come. Most congressional meetings, um, we plan them to start after 10 a.m. So, um, you know, plan accordingly when you get your schedule on Monday, Tuesday, to figure out which bus kind of works best for you and your energy levels. Um, again, we'll have the breakfast available for you um, in um, on the Hill. Um, we're calling our base camp. Um, and so um, if you want to have breakfast, uh, there you are. But, you're, you know, again, it's completely optionary, um, optional for you. Um, after you go through and do all of your uh, meeting starting at 10 a.m. Um, we will have snacks and refreshment service beginning at 11 a.m. And then um, as Emily re um, referred to, if you are interested in telling your story and being recorded, there will be an option to start doing that at around one o'clock. And then um, we've asked that all congressional meetings kind of wrap up around 4 p.m. Um, so between 10 and 4 p.m., you know, everyone will kind of be coming in going um, from our base camp um, to their meetings. Um, so you'll see people in the hall and everything. Um, and then in the evening on Wednesday, um, we will then having what we call the MECFS Champions Reception. And that will be from 4 to 6 p.m. And there will be light refreshments um, for everyone who is attending. Um, our base camp is a, is a room where we will be gathering. Um, again, there'll be breakfast and snacks. Um, there will also be places for you to um, relax and refresh. Um, there will be some cots, um, some blankets, and of course, horizontal space will be available. And so um, that's the thing, uh, something for just to keep in mind of, you know, making sure you come back and, you know, take a break if needed. Um, Emily mentioned, I think someone asked in one of our uh, trainings two weeks ago about um, yoga mats and taking breaks actually in the halls. And as Emily said, those buildings are ours. We're, we're paying for them as, as 
taxpayers. So um, feel free if you want to bring a yoga mat, please do. You can take a break in the hallway. You can bring the yoga mat to the base camp room um, to lie down and just, um, you know, to regather. Um, one thing to know is that throughout the day on April 3rd, um, as you're going to your meetings, the goal is to be there about 15 minutes prior to the meeting time. Um, and this gives an opportunity for you to meet with the other people who will be who will be coming into the meeting with you. So other members of your state, maybe it's advanced advocates who have been willing to help out in meetings. Um, so you want to kind of gather together um, to kind of figure out the game plan of what of who will be covering what in your meetings. Um, because again, you only have about 15 to 20 minutes in your meetings. And so you want to make sure you know who's doing kind of the introductions, um, how many people will be telling their story, and then who will be doing the ask, who will be taking notes. So those kind of hallway conversations are really important to kind of figure out the layout of what that meeting will actually look like. Um, yeah, so that's really um, that date. And then the other thing is, <laughs> here is the lovely Capitol Hill um, map. Um, as you can see, um, on the left-hand side, we have our little base camp with a little tent. Um, and you can see it's down on the um, lower corner. Yeah, I, our little mouse is helping us out. Um, and then um, you can see below that is where the bus will be dropping people off, um, which is just about one block lower of that. And then up north, um, we have our Senate buildings, um, which lovely pop up. This is a great little uh, slide there. Um, and so that's where the Senate buildings will be. And then um, lower down, yep, back where we have our uh, base camp and where the buses will be dropping off or where the house um, office buildings are located. Yeah. Okay, so just a couple in information about the Capitol Hill. Um, there is street parking if you are lucky. Um, it's kind of, you know, not it's not easily accessible and not easily available, but there is street parking if available or um, kind of just north of the map that we were showing is Union Station um, and there is all day parking available. So if you're coming in for the day, those are your options if you are driving into um, DC of that day. Um, just so that you can save some steps, Definitely take a look at the map. Um, you'll be getting a map when you in your folder on Tuesday, uh, but take a look at a map to see, you know, what's the easiest way to get to and from two points. Um, and then also look for signs or ask for directions for the closest path to your meeting. Um, one tip is, is always ask an intern um, to maybe walk you from one meeting to the next to help you get to the, the place easiest is is the buildings can be confusing. There's multiple floors, multiple buildings. So um, it's always great if you have somebody to help you out who, who works there. Also, again, as we talked about on the training, you'll be learning how to use a mobile tool. Um, so that's really great. You know, as you leave your meetings, um, maybe take a couple of minutes to step outside the office, take your notes in the mobile tool, upload it, um, fill out the information so that you capture every all of your thoughts in one place as your meeting has come, come to an end. Um, and then also um, we'll be doing meeting reports. Um, so this is kind of like a, um, you know, a review of how the meeting went. Um, there will be some on paper, but then also on the mobile tool, you'll be able to fill it out. Um, and this is just a really great opportunity for you to kind of debrief of how everything went. You'll let us know who you met with, hopefully their contact information. Um, you'll let us know how the asks went, um, if they said yes to certain things, if they had questions about other things, if they said no to something. Those are all helpful notes for us, um, both Emily and I, as we come back um, from Advocacy Day and, and how we build upon those relationships moving forward and how you guys as advocates also will build upon those relationships. So those reports are really important for us. Um, we do ask that, you know, um, people fill those out for, um, for each meeting that they attend. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, so then I'm just gonna touch, and for those of you who were with us last year, these are literally the exact same slides from last year. So I apologize for repeating the same information, but um, I think for the new folks, this is gonna be really helpful. Um, so really quickly, an overview of Capitol Hill. As you saw in the map, the Capitol building is in the center, and then there's a Senate side and a House side. The House side is made up of three buildings. 
that have all of the member offices on multiple floors. So Rayburn Building is the largest building. It's the furthest to the west uh, at the bottom of the hill. Longworth is the building in the middle, moving up the hill to the east. Um, and then Cannon is at the very top, which is where we're going to be starting and where you're, the bus will drop you off um, on the house side closest to the east um, uh, in that whole, whole little, they're all in a row. Now, the house buildings, Rayburn, Longworth, and Cannon, all have underground passages that connect them, so you don't have to go outside and go back through security. The only time you need to go outside and back through security is if you have to cross from the house side to the Senate side. Now, speaking of the Senate side, on the, as you saw on the map on the opposite side of the Capitol, there are three Senate buildings. Russell, which is the closest um, to, the, to the west side, which is closest to the Capitol, Dirksen, which is in the middle, and Hart, which is the newest and the largest, which is furthest from the Capitol, um, moving, we were moving west to east. So Hart is the furthest east, Russell is the furthest west. Hart and Dirksen are very tightly connected. It's very, it can be confusing which one you're in. Just look at the plates if they start with a D or an H. Because um, I find it often I'll wander from Hart to Dirksen because they're connected on multiple floors. Um, and I won't realize I'd wandered into a different building. Um, so that's some of the heads up about the three office building. And so when you get your schedule, it will say things like you noticed as our base camp room is one, two, one cannon. That means it's in the cannon office building on the first floor room 121. Um, so that'll kind of help you guide a little bit. Um, the first number, with the exception of Canon, which doesn't have a first number, so most room numbers are going to be four digits. The first number, with the, again, the exception of Canon, is, um, is the building that you're in. So for example, Longworth, I believe all those numbers start with one, and Rayburn, they all start with two. Then the second number, or the, the third digit, is the floor that it's on. And then the last two digits are the room number. So that's pretty much the same throughout all the house buildings and the Senate buildings. So you can kind of get a sense of if it's a three digit number on the house side, it's in Canon. If it's a four digit number, it's one in one of the other two buildings. Same thing with the Senate numbers. If it's three digits, it's in Hart. If it's four digits, it's in one of the other ones. Um, so then really quickly, there are multiple entrances to each building as you saw on the map, and the map, you'll, you'll also get a copy of that in your packets, has a little blue dot. That blue dot is all the handicap accessible pathways. And it, the map identifies the handicap accessible entrances to each building. Again, there are tunnels in between each. So, um, so the only time you need to get out of the tunnels and go through security again is if you're crossing from the House side to the Senate side or from the Senate side back to the House side. And then from there, you'll need to exit and re-enter security. But if you're going from house to house building or Senate to Senate building, you can just take your underground pathways or connections and you don't have to go back through security. Every building has security, so they're kind of like your lines at an airport. You might need to need to leave yourself some extra time to wait in the security line. Um, notes about going through security, you do not need to take off your shoes. You do need to remove any metal objects from your person, keys, belts, laptops, phones, et cetera, and put them in. Um, and I know we've gotten this question a couple times. What do I wear? Dress is generally business casual, but we will be providing you um, a dark blue t-shirt because the color of uh, MACFS is dark blue. So you'll have your blue t-shirt. Um, I also recommend comfortable shoes. I am notoriously the one on Capitol Hill who will wear like a full business suit and then sneakers because I know that um, those cute little dress shoes with the heels are going to kill me by the end of the day. So that is the, um, I say wear whatever shoes are most comfortable for you, whether they match your outfit or not. <laughs> and then the rest of your clothes can be uh, business casual. Um, and then of course our, our, uh, our t-shirts. Um, so that's the end of our organized remarks. Um, we had so many questions. I'm so excited. So with yeah. your permission, everybody will go a couple minutes over to help tackle some of these questions. Um, Erin, you want to take it away? Yes, definitely. So I'm getting a couple of um, logistical questions. Um, the first one is, base, was, was the base camp room that we're using this year the same as last year? And I'm going to, Emily, I'm going to, I think it's, the answer is no. I think we're in a different building, this, a different room. No, we're in the same building, different room, but we're literally right next door. So last year we were in 122, this year we're in 121. Yes. 
So um, yeah, so hopefully if you were last year, you know where to go, just go across the hall. Um, and then the other one is how do we get back to the Marriott after um, advocacy day and um, we are not providing transportation back um, just because everyone's schedules are so different and so unique um, and that um, people will be leaving at different times it's kind of hard to um, bring together a certain um, buses on that type of system um, so there of course are different ways to get back um, there's you know taxis Lyft um, Uber um, there's also the metro, there's a stop kind of outside the Cannon building that you can get onto, and there's also a stop nearby the, the hotel. Um, so that is an option. Um, I know that um, riding the metro can be a little com um, unique and tiring for new people um, in, in that area as you're having to pay attention to making sure you get off at the right transfer places. Um, but that is an option that is available for everyone. So um, just kind of play it by ear on what is available for you. And maybe you could carpool and uh, share a taxi or a lift back with people. Yeah. Awesome. And then, Thank you. Oh, and then just a couple of questions about today's um, today's training. And so as we uh, mentioned at the beginning is that this training is being recorded. Um, and so it will be uploaded to YouTube, um, both on um, SMCI and ME Action's YouTube page. So you can definitely refer to it again. Um, and there also will be a link um, provided to it on our ME Advocacy Week website, um, if you're looking for where to access it. So those, so this, so you will be able to review this and hear, hear our lovely voices again if you want to. Absolutely. So um, I'm just going to, and I know we're running up on time, so I'm going to try and quickly uh, bounce through as many of these questions as I can. Um, first of all, if you are taking the metro, there is a shuttle that the hotel offers from the metro station to the, to the hotel and back. Um, I believe you can just call the front office line of the hotel and call and ask for the shuttle to come pick you up. Um, and it runs on a regular basis. Um, another question is, can we bring in water and snacks into the buildings? Um, yes, they do need to go through uh, the, uh, the x-ray machine, but you can bring them through. Um, and then just as a note, uh, you, as we pointed out, um, the folks who work in the offices, uh, they are there to help you. And so if you have questions about where your next meeting is, you can always ask one of the people at the front desk to walk you to your next meeting. It's really helpful because they know all the shortcuts. Um, and they're excited to, to get an opportunity to stand up and walk around because they sit at their desk all day. So don't feel shy about asking them for help. Um, a couple of thoughts about our webinar, very friendly compliments. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate that. Um, a couple of questions on transportation. How long does it take for the bus to arrive at the Capitol? Um, we're targeting about 40 minutes to an hour from Bethesda to the Capitol, but that keep in mind that that's during rush hour traffic. So ordinarily, if the traffic is not bad, I'd say it's about a 20 minute drive from the Capitol to Bethesda. It could be as little as 15 minutes. It sort of just depends on the the, the gods of traffic and whether or not the, um, the main thoroughfares are clear at that time. Um, so when I've taken a, um, for example, I've taken a Lyft or an Uber, from the capital to Bethesda in traffic, it can take me 45 minutes to an hour. Um, when traffic is not bad, especially at the end of the day when people are kind of heading uh, and it's a little looser, um, it's about $20, $25 and it takes me about 20 minutes. Um, so it just really depends on, on um, how the traffic patterns are going um, around. Uh, and then, um, I think that's on most of the key questions. One other question was about the height of the parking garage. Um, at Bethesda Marriott, it's an outdoor parking lot, so I don't believe height is an issue. If you are going to park at Union Station, it is an underground lot, and I do not know the height restrictions of that lot, but um, you can always try and find parking, or there's also other paid parking lots tucked around Capitol Hill. They know that people are driving in. There's plenty, I mean, depending on how much we want to pay, there's plenty of parking around. Um, I used to work at the Hall of States building, which is um, not too far from the Senate side, kind of halfway in between Union Station and the Senate House Office buildings. They do have public parking there. I believe it's about $20 a day, and it's on the roof, so I don't think there's any height restrictions. So if, um, if you're looking for a, a, a high-profile vehicle to park, that might be a good place to go. Um, 
And then the last question, and I'll try and get to the rest afterwards, I'm just trying to be respectful of everyone's time, um, is regarding the Monday evening uh, check-in hours in the lobby of the Bethesda Hotel. Um, Aaron and I still need to powwow on that. We're getting our travel schedule sorted, but we'll make sure to post that on the website as soon as we have those hours solidified. Um, wow, so many questions. Thank you all so much. Um, I think that brings us to the top of the hour. Aaron, do you wanna say any final thoughts? Yeah, no, just thank you all for joining today's training and for, um, you know, I know a good chunk of you will be joining us next week. Um, so we're just like, really excited and looking forward to, um, to, to the week. It's going to be a really amazing time. And just thank you so much for all of your guys' um, help and input. Um, we look forward to having a really successful day. So thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Aaron, and um, really appreciate you all joining us. Very much looking forward to seeing you in D.C., and then I'll just leave you with the final notes that, um, that all of the items relating to MECFS Advocacy Week and Advocacy Day are all being posted on the website, which is www.meadvocacyweek.com. Everything we spoke about here, including the Q&A, is going to be on that website. The recording of this video will be on the website. Um, your meeting report forms, there will be a link on the website. So um, please refer to that website as your hub of information. All of the schedules, agenda items, everything is on there. Um, so if you ever have any questions, that's the place to go, www.me advocacyweek.com. Um, and with that, I will say thank you again and have a wonderful safe travels and we will see you on the East Coast in Washington, D.C. in a week.